Hello everybody and welcome to Slice TV. This week's episode I'm here with Michael Bryden, director of MSB Max, to talk about, well, leadership is the discussion for this week's uh, episode and how important it is and what we should maybe do to look after our leaders in our companies to make sure they stay and I guess make the companies a better place to be. And help them develop as well. What is the key to all this leadership discussion? Or, or firstly, before we go down that road, I'm sorry to cut you off. That's quite all right. Tell me, tell me a little bit about Michael and, and how did you end up with MSB Max? What's the background behind Michael Bryden? Uh, well, those are two distinctive, distinct questions. What's the background behind, although obviously I'm co-founder of, of MSB Max. Um, it's been a long time in the making, and I suppose that's the Michael Bryden side. Uh, born and raised in the uh, province of Nova Scotia in Canada, Cape Breton Island to be exact, and a uh, long journey to, uh, to come to Perth, and I've been here, oh, 13 years now, so this is really home, I suppose. I've been here as longer, longer than I was in, my, in the home that I grew up in as a child, so this is home. Now, in our past discussions, you told me about these interesting jobs that you used to have <coughs> where... You were asked to come and fix up companies that weren't working well. Yeah, and, and that, interestingly, that wasn't really by design. Um, I found myself segueing after uh, pursuing a Bachelor of Science degree at uni from the ages of 18 through to 22, uh, and I double majored in physics and psychology. So anybody watching, you know, they go, physics and psychology, that's a bit odd combination, but yeah, that's, those are the ones I liked, so those are the ones that I did. <laughs> And uh, when you get out, you decide, hmm, well, we're not really quite sure what to do with that. So uh, after a bit of a few segues, I found myself actually in the hotel and resort in industry. And I uh, stayed in that business for a uh, better part of 15 years and worked my way up through the ranks to uh, finally get to a position where I was a regional director of sales and marketing and general manager and uh, for some uh, five-star uh, luxury hotels. Uh, that was an exceptional training ground for me because most people think about hotels and resorts, particularly at that level, as being, uh, their experience is the experience of a guest. And at that level, the experience of a guest, hopefully if you're doing everything well, is, uh, is exceptional. From a development perspective and from a training and, uh, and learning new skills perspective, that was an exceptional training ground. Uh, because you have a lot of different aspects that you have to overcome, and you're dealing with a lot of uh, a lot of people in your in your team, and a lot, and you actually have to excel at uh, at the experience for the guests. So you develop skills uh, if you're going to stay in that industry and do well at it. You have to develop uh, pretty keen skills, and and that's been the uh, the whole the undercurrent of a 30-year career is uh, learning, absorbing. Uh, and developing skills. Here we are at MSB Max, which enables me to uh, do that uh, full time. And instead of just helping one company or the the uh, the people within the uh, one organization, I can uh, offer it out, and we can hopefully uh, help many. Now, okay, well, there's a beautiful segue. So, what is MSB Max? Tell me a little bit about it. MSB Max is something that's been probably over 10 years in the making in, uh, in my mind, just playing around. Again, as I start um, thinking about what it is that I've loved doing over the course of my career and what uh, the greatest satisfaction that I got. And I've had the opportunity over the years also to do a, a lot of internal training, a lot of internal um, training within the organizations that I've had, but I've also had the opportunity to be uh, guest lecturer at, uh, at universities and guest lecturer at colleges and things and um, so I had a taste for it and I just really enjoyed it. Uh, watching the people develop and grow was a, it's a sensational buzz for me. I started laying the groundwork for it about three years ago and I did a lot of research as to what company, what training companies and training and development companies were doing uh, some things they weren't doing necessarily that I uh, thought I might be able to improve upon. And I put all that research over the last three years together and have been writing programs and training programs and developing and uh, all the uh, trials and tribulations of starting up your own business, mm -hmm. as you would know yourself. Uh, and uh, that's been a interesting, but uh, fortunately I've got a few arrows in my quiver, quiver over the last uh, 30 years of, of career to pull from and be able to smooth out some of those 
bumps in the road. Well, I mean, you would have had a lot of experience from looking after big, huge hotel chains and saying, okay, this is what you need to fix. This is where the problems are. This is how have you worked out, okay, on a scale where they might have five to 10,000 employees at one hotel to then come back to you mm. and, and focus, okay, how do I make MSB Max something different mm. than other leadership companies? There's a lot of training companies out there. There's a lot of yeah. big training companies out there. What makes MSB Max different from what you've put into it? I suppose, uh, I hope those weren't that big. I, I, I didn't uh, go to Vegas or any of those where they do have the five and 10,000 room hotels. Mine were in the 500 uh, to 1,000, 500 to 800, 800 range. But at 508 to 800 rooms, uh, you've, got any, you've got about 1,000 staff. And that is uh, across the board. So a lot of different disciplines uh, to make that guest experience what it needs to be or what you want it to be. Which, and that's a lot of people to motivate and inspire and uh, understand the vision. And that's precisely what makes the difference between uh, you get to that echelon of, uh, of hotels and resorts, for example, and uh, there's not a lot of differentiation between the actual properties themselves. They all have basically the same amenities, the, you know, the decor and the ambiance and everything is, is at a high level. So the difference is the experience that the people provide. And that is exactly the same in any other organization. It's that culture, that environment, uh, that's going to be the make or break for any organization. It doesn't matter, you can have the best systems in the world, you can actually even have the best products in the world, uh, if that's what, you, what your business is, to, uh, to sell, develop and sell products. But if you don't have the people aspect right, then it's not going to work. Mm. Yeah. It's certainly not going to work as well as it could. And how have you seen that in action? Uh, over the course of my career, a lot, uh, both with organizations that I've uh, worked with and uh, observed outside. And that's what I've, what I've garnered and I've picked, and I've picked to pieces uh, what it is that really takes, what's the magic formula, if you will, uh, to make the uh, organization really hum and hit on all cylinders. And it's all about the people. It's all about the people. Uh, the old adage about getting them on the bus, but it's the old adage about getting them on the bus, singing from the same hymn sheet, all knowing in the, which direction they're going in and, want, and where they're coming from and, and wanting to get there. And then the magic happens. How do you achieve that? How do you go about that process? Uh, different elements of, of, uh, dis uh, of developing leadership. And uh, when I say leadership, I don't mean the one or two or handful of uh, executives that are, in t that are uh, you know, at the top of an organization. Leadership goes through the, the entire organization. You have leadership at all different levels. Uh, now it's key that all those leaders are in sync and that'll provide, that'll uh, usually necessitate that the rest of the organization is in sync and that's why you're all going in the same direction instead of spanning out and everybody going where they think things should, should be. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's our vision. Oh, I know how to get there. Well, we need to go there. And someone else says, oh, I, I think we need to go there that's not going to work. Um, they have an idea of the vision and they, they want to attain it, but if they're not all going in the same direction, then you're gonna have some challenges. And that's one of the things that uh, good leadership does is it gets everybody to really understand and appreciate uh, that we're going to go there. And then say, okay, how are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. get everybody else's input because you're going to get different perspectives on the best ways to do that, and then you say pick the best ones, and that's that's the uh, the kind of the the uh, trick of it all. So uh, a lot of companies say grab people and build them up. Mm -hmm. Like for an example, I think you've talked to me before about how you might have you might be the best salesperson, mm. and the position of a new sales manager comes in. And they go, all oh, right, cool, we'll get the best salesperson to be the new sales manager because he's the best at sales. Doesn't always work well though, does it? No, and unfortunately it doesn't work well most of the time. And the reason is uh, because it's a completely different skill set. And you see it in many different organizations. Sales is, it happens, you see it quite often. Uh, but it happens in trades, anything where there's a specialty, te technical type of skill. When I say technical, I don't mean uh, scientific or necessarily uh, IT. I mean, it could be a tradesperson. You could be a carpenter, and uh, then you've made a foreman. Or you could be a uh, you know a, a doctor or a nurse, 
and then, and you're made a shift supervisor. Now, one of the things is that you hopefully, if you're good at sales, is uh, you've got reasonably good people skills. So that is certainly a crossover. But after that, you go from selling to managing and leading, preferably, a team of other people, mm. other salespeople. And uh, it is an absolutely, it's 180 degrees in regard to how you have to approach it and the skill set that you need to do it well. Uh, whether you're going from a practicing nurse on the floor to uh, managing a shift to, uh, you know, you're a, a, a sparky to becoming a, a, a foreman uh, to a salesperson to becoming a sales manager or a department person that only has a small team to become uh, an executive where now you have a whole division. Yeah. It's a different ballgame. And I guess a lot of people probably can relate. They're probably even thinking, as you say, this, thinking, oh, yeah, such and such got promoted up, and, and they're shocking at looking after that team. It's, uh, it's absolutely prolific. You see it everywhere, and it doesn't have to happen. Uh, first of all, the, the organizational leadership and executive need to understand that it is a different skill set, so uh, try not to set them up for failure. Uh, but then, obviously, make an investment if that's the person that you want to go into that uh, level, because they're chances are that they'd like the opportunity. Um, they may not even know mm. how much of a transition it's going to be. And it, be, it can become quite a, quite a shock. Michael, tell me, okay, basically, to you, what is leadership? Well, to me, and, and it's one of those things that if you ask uh, 100 different people, you may get a 100 different answers. But there'll be elements that'll be, um, that'll be the same. Uh, to me, the simple answer and I've got one that's probably a paragraph long because it takes in all the elements. Uh, but the simple one is to be able to develop and um, an environment, some people call it culture. I prefer to call it an environment because uh, it, get, it gets a little more clear for people. To, to be able to provide and nurture an environment within it, whether it's in your team or whether it's in your organization, that allows people to thrive and produce. Uh, so when they start producing of their own volition, you know you're well down the track. And they start coming forth with ideas, and those ideas are good, and they're in sync with what you're trying to attain, then you know you've both been doing th good things. It's a two-way street. You lead leaders, or you allow people to bring forth and, and uh, contribute, because that's one of our basic needs and, and wants. Uh, if you look at the, the, the hierarchy of needs, we've got our basic safety needs, and then we've got our uh, you know, necessary things like food and water and warmth and heat and so forth. But as you work your way up that pyramid, you get into areas where people want to be acknowledged, they want to contribute, they want to be appreciated. Those are the intangible things. Those are the things that companies may try to do through external incentives, like bonuses or perks and things like that. Those work to a degree. But they don't bring out, uh, they don't resonate with that level of, uh, of someone. And that's, if, they, if you want innovation, innovation is a huge buzzword these days yeah. because we're in a time where organizations have to innovate to be competitive. And where do you think the innovation comes from? I mean, most people think it just comes from the lab. If you're, you know, if you're Apple computer, then you got these guys back in the corner there with the, behind the pizza boxes and the Coke cans uh, developing the next innovation. But that's not where innovation comes from. They're the, they te they're the technical. The ideas come from your whole organization. You never know where the be next best idea is going to come from. So if you have an environment where these people understand, they want to actually contribute, and they want to participate in this journey down to the to that uh, attaining that vision then they will bring their ideas forth and they will cooperate as well amongst themselves and they'll each bring all kinds of other things assets and talents that you may not even rec uh, realize that you had within your organization they'll bring those forth if you don't have that to put it in perspective context if you don't have that environment you've got people just showing up and punching a clock and just putting in time and they're just going to give you their time because now, now they're doing a job. And nobody likes to do a job. Everybody wants to contribute and, and be participa you know, participate in something that's bigger than themselves. And they may not want to admit that, but everybody does. 
that's 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 just human nature. Without I don't know, offending or dropping too many names, you're probably not allowed to drop down. Can <laughs> can you think of any examples or case studies where you've seen the success and the and the opposite? I can think of hundreds actually, and that's why, particularly in in developing the the programs that that uh, we've been developing, most of the contents of the programs that we come from what what has worked, what either has worked for me in my own career or what I've seen, and I've been an observer like you would not believe. Two things that I've uh, that I've done over the years is absorb an enormous amount of information from every source I could. I've read more books and listened to more tapes and uh, and uh, gone to more seminars than the average bear, that's for sure. And uh, and then observed, watched, watched other people, watched people that were doing well, watched people that weren't doing too well, and why? Ask why? Okay, why does that work? Why does that? Why does that not work? Uh, one of my GMs as I was coming up through the hotel uh, industry uh, early in my career. Um, and obviously I won't name this gentleman's name, but uh, beautiful hotel, um, nice, keen staff, uh, horrible general manager, horrible people skills, really old school, you will do this, almost uh, military style. So military, for example, that to go into, you get summoned to his office because he wanted to uh, know about something that happened or what, how the prog- something was progressing, and you had to get up put your jacket on, straighten your tie, always go in with a notebook and a, a pen and sit there until you were ready to, he was ready to have uh, to give you his audience. Uh, and that type of, um, I learned an enormous amount from that gentleman, enormous amount of what not to do. Did you ever get the privilege <laughs> then of working in the opposite to find oh, very, oh, and seeing the yeah, opposite? I have, I've, had, uh, I've been very fortunate to have uh, a, a, a number of of uh, people that were superior to me that I learned from, uh, mentors from other organizations. Uh, like I said, I would, I, would, I would seek them out. I mm. would look for them because I was wanting to, s- I was looking for the better way. There's gotta be a better way to do this. And there's gotta be a, a way to get everybody else in line and, uh, and really invigorated and inspired to do this with me. And whenever I could, I was always looking for the better way to do that. Okay, you've, you've just stated some really good classic examples. It was almost, I think, I can think of TV shows where you have that, <laughs> that, op, that GM where it's just fear. It's about fear. It's about perpetuating fear in the workforce <clears throat> to hopefully get them to work or at least to come to work and do work or what it wants to do. Hmm. Now, fear is an incredible motivator. It, Probably one of the more powerful ones, actually. But unfortunately, it's not sustainable and it will not generate trust or demonstrate integrity. And those are the cornerstones of, uh, of a positive, high, product, high productive producing uh, team, uh, be that team, the organi- whole organization, or a, a, a portion of it. Um, it works, fear works, there's no doubt about it, um, it uh, but it's not recommended because it's not, uh, it'll work if you want short-term gains. Uh, it'll work if you want to, uh, if you're going to be only in an organization for a short time, uh, get it up, build it up to a point where you want to, you're going to make your bonus, and then uh, exit stage left. Uh, you can go in and, and use the fear tactic. It'll work in the short term. In the long term, however, the uh, repercussions and the costs involved in it are enormous because you'll have in, in, increased uh, your, your retention level will go way down and your exit level will go way up, and that's that's probably a cost that most organizations don't give enough uh, a, cre- a credit to. It's enormous cost, and if they have the proper environment and they do the right things, then that cost goes way down, and you'll be not only retain people and not have that cost, but you'll retain people that want to be there and want to contribute and go along on mm. that vision journey with you. So how do we get away from these old models of leadership that no longer work, and what are the new models that come in? I don't know if they're necessarily new models. They're just getting a little more of a buff up and, a, and an attention. Um, because we've gone through, over the last era, since uh, in the last 40 years, we've gone through the first 25 or so, where organizations, first of all, the times were good, and uh, the business was reasonably good. And you could, we got really into a, 
place where an organization was a mechanism and that mechanism was so they wanted organizations you remember catchphrases we want to be super efficient and we want to be uh, we wanted to run like a well-oiled machine those types of catchphrases mm -hmm. and, and were, were synonymous and but when you look at those you're describing a machine yeah and an organization's not made up you may have machines, there's plenty of machines in your organization perhaps, but to, to do specific things. But your organization isn't a machine because there's people in your organization and uh, the, you don't treat people like machines. Organizations are now never being forced to tap into their own resources within their own organizations nearly as much as they have had to in the past mm -hmm. because there are other avenues to be able to bump that profit up or get that margin expanded or whatever you, uh, your targets might be. Now, it's a little bit more difficult and the changes are firing at you at a rapid, rapidly, so you have to have your people contributing and all on the same page and being very much in sync with what you're trying to do. That is going, to, that's the new competitive advantage. That more so than we've got a better system than they do or we've got a better product than they do. Uh, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, the products are not that much different. Yeah. And if it is that much different, the catch-up time for another organization to make theirs as good or perhaps even better is going to be very short, months, not years anymore. It's months mm -hmm. before you've got that, uh, you've got a shelf life of a few months before your competitor either has improved their product to as good as yours and perhaps even better. What's the secret? Your people. Same, similarly, similarly, how I described the difference between one five-star resort and another. Yeah. Their systems, their amenities, their uh, machinery, their mechanism are, going to, are all going to be very, very similar. The difference is going to be in the team, the people. One will have a very, will, would have a very good team, one may not. That's the one you feel it. It's palpable, both as the guest and as a as person that's uh, on the team. But you can notice the difference between people from one hotel to the other, and that can relate to an engineering company, an accounting company, a law firm, or whatever. It does Absolutely, happen. Uh, without a doubt, it, uh, and it happens externally and internally. The external one is a little more difficult for organizations to pick up on. There, are, you know, every organization is, uh, is always surveying and trying to get information from their uh, from their clients uh, to how how can we do better. Hmm. Um, one of the things that the clients know, they'll know whether your product is as good or better than the competition. Of course they will because they've shopped around. And in this day and age, it's never been easier to shop around. Uh, but the thing is, they will really understand how they're being treated. And who's treating them? Is it the product that's treating them? No, it's your people. It's your people. And so that's the external side. Internally, it's the, it's, that's why I like the word environment. It's the environment of thriving or driving. You know, you just have to, uh, people will get that feeling that they like to work together. You spend eight hours or plus a day, you spend more mm -hmm. time at work than you do in any other activity during the course of your life. Yeah. So you're spending more time with your colleagues and your, your workmates than you are with your family, uh, in waking hours at least. And uh, if you can make it a, a family, and I don't want to sound too fluffy and all uh, but but if you can make that type of feeling amongst your team and then give them something to work on or work toward together they'll amaze you uh, but and it's the, 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 the astounding thing is how seldom you see that how you how seldom you see that type of environment most organizations and leaders of organizations they know this they that's what they want but they may not want know exactly how to get there. And that gives MSB Max and other training and development companies the opportunity because we can help them. So is it about uh, being open and transparent with goals and ambitions from the, whether or not it's a CEO or like you say, managers down the line and always being, having, is it a meeting thing? How do you, what is the, what is the, what does the, what, the, what makes that up? How do you go about that? Well, it, that's just it and that's, that's why it takes over 30 years of experience and a lot of observation, a lot of energy of, uh, to put all this, uh, this formula, or this recipe together because it's, uh, it isn't one, one, one thing. There's no silver bullet. 
it's always a combination of things. If you think about it in the way that, uh, when you think about people and the way our brains work, very complex. So if you're going to say, okay, we've got our systems right, we've got our products right, we've got our, uh, you know, our procedures and processes right, uh, what's, the, what's next? Well, it's the people part. Ooh, okay. This one has a manual. That one has a, you know, a guideline. People one, hmm. No real manual for that one. Uh, uh, but there is because we're people ourselves. So we know what we're trying to strive for and we know what we're trying to do. And for the, uh, I see now, probably more so than ever, uh, people are uh, finally acknowledging that and there's more of a focus in that area, which is great because that's the key. It, uh, it goes from the top down and from the, and from the bottom up. But from the top, there's some key factors. You do have to be transparent, as you mentioned. That's absolutely, uh, otherwise you're going to say, hey, we've come up with this fantastic strategy and it doesn't seem to be getting any traction. Well, that's because two layers down the, uh, the hierarchy don't even know what you're trying to do. Uh, so the transparency and proper communication is key. Uh, those things and then doing what you say you're going to be doing going to be doing those things build integrity then integrity builds trust and then it starts to all come full circle you, mm -hmm. you build all, all of those factors in and there's way and, and people oh yeah well I'll just go out and hire those type of people well yeah you could do that or you could develop it because one of the biggest misnomers uh, that I've seen throughout my career and I continue to see um, is that people go oh those are soft skills or they're things that uh, either you're born with and it's uh, baloney it's absolutely mm. bollocks uh, these are skills hitting I know you're an avid golfer it's you know did you learn how to play golf by reading a book or did were you <laughs> innately born with the talent uh, you can be innately born with an aptitude for it which still needs to be developed mm. you know, Tiger Woods may have had an aptitude for golf but if he didn't practice he wouldn't be the, uh, you know, he wouldn't have got to the echelon that he did. It's exactly the same with leadership and other elemental skills like communication. Uh, it's exactly the same. They're skills. They can be developed. We have talked about me and my <laughs> golf playing as, uh, when, I, when I was good at a long, long time ago. But I got told very early on that, because golf I practiced all the time. I lived it. Loved practicing. Mm. I love practicing golf. But don't practice to get it perfect. Pra practice to never get it wrong. And also, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, I see people that are going to be practicing the wrong thing continuously and then yeah. wondering why it's not, they're not getting any better at it. Yeah. So is that where the segue into leadership well, skills comes in? Because you could be trying to train your leaders or your uh, managers and doing the wrong kind of training. Uh, indeed. That's why you need to step out and go to someone like a training development company. Uh, like ourselves, there's others out there that, uh, that can help. It's important, you need that expertise to be able to come in with a, because we've developed skill sets in our own uh, right, to be able to uh, not only demonstrate and uh, deliver the different a aspects of the recipe, but show you how to bake the cake. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I suppose that was one of the key elements that I wanted to make sure that we built into MSB Max. It's not just to provide a heightened awareness of, uh, of this or that or the other thing. Hell, you, can, you can read a book for that. Uh, you go to a training and you come out and you're pumped up and you go, yeah, that stuff makes complete sense to me. Absolute makes complete sense. Great. You go back and see them three months later and they're doing exactly the same thing as they used to because they haven't practiced. It's that disciplined practice, practice and that deliberate practice that are essential. And that's one of the things that we like to think is a bit different with MSB Max is we've built that into the program. You don't just come, you get the theory and the concepts and you get them explained so you have a very good understanding and appreciation of those and how they should work. And then we work on with you how to make them work. Yeah. So you develop the skill. So when we walk out of the picture you, and come back three months later just to take a peek, how are you doing? You've moved ahead, you're actually using those things and uh, using those skills, those extra arrows in your quiver that I like to uh, use the metaphor about. And uh, you've, uh, you've, you've grown and you've developed and you'll be able to see, that, you'll be able to see and feel the difference, both on the, uh, on the balance sheet 
and in the uh, in the environment, in the atmosphere, in the culture of the organization. So is that one of the things that you you look at? Is uh, balance sheet isn't probably as important. It's more about are people staying. How do you, how do you analyze a company to see if the well, if, if I went, if I if I uh, if I went into any organization and said, "Oh, don't worry about your balance sheet," they'd uh, last <laughs> about three seconds. I wouldn't. Uh, they'd go, "Okay, yep, yeah, thanks. Nice talking to you. Out you go." Uh, balance sheet is and profitability are the be all and end all. It's in, incredibly important. What we're suggesting is, and not just suggesting, it's proven. What we're doing will improve that. All of this filters down and improves your productivity. But we're not addressing the product. We're not addressing the productivity. We're not addressing the profitability directly. We're doing it in through the influencers of that within your organization. We're making the environment, the culture, to be able to improve that better. But we're not doing it there. We're doing it over here, with your people. So if you get them to be able to have great communication and open lines and good transparency in the organization and a high level of integrity and trust within the organization, both within the different tiers and within the, all the different work groups and the different people. The things that they can provide and the things that they will do, as I said earlier, will astound you. And that affects the other. That affects the financial side enormously. But it's hard to draw a line to it. It's hard to draw a line to it until you can go back and see it over time. Has that been your hardest part to sort of prove or show? I mean, sometimes I'll think of, okay, mm. my work, I still need to, oddly enough, prove videos are an effective communication yeah. tool. I wouldn't have thought I needed to nowadays, but I still actually need to actually be going well, down there's that different, line. there's different people out there that have different perspectives and different values as to what is works and what doesn't. Um, and, but yes, that is one of the things that we are uh, having to show at all times. People make an investment, they say, okay, we'll go out and we'll get a, somebody to come in and have training. Uh, often they don't know exactly what they need, so that's one aspect of it, helping them work with that so you're not just coming in and delivering training for the sake of it. Uh, you want the training to be relevant, not only to your situation, but to your people, so you can develop the people, and it's relevant to them, so they want to develop. Uh, but the, uh, then you want to also provide an ROI or a return on, the, on that investment. And that one uh, has been, and that's one of the things that I've been very, really studying over the last three years. I've put a lot of time and energy and uh, research into, okay, how can we make training show a tangible return? Mm. Because you're changing uh, environments. They will have a positive effect on the end result, absolutely no doubt, over time. But these people are saying, okay, here's a laying down my money. Okay, MSB Max or ABC training organization, come in. We're going to pay you to help our team get, get better. Um, they want to see some return on that and think we've come up with a reasonably good way to, uh, to do that in a little more short term. Two elements, and uh, one is that we do a lot of pre-testing. A lot of research went into this to try and make sure that we got the right ones that were going to be relevant to uh, what we were trying to affect. Uh, so we do upfront testing and then we do post testing, and uh, and if we've done our job properly, then you'll see a, a delta. You'll see a positive variance. Uh, the other thing that we do, and this is actually quite different than most organizations and that, that do what we do, practical exercises, both that we discuss to make the the concepts more real so people can understand them, but also in the practical application of them so we can develop a skill isn't a case study or a, uh, an exercise from another organization or, you know, it's not from Apple or IBM, it's from their organization. So we work with the organizations really closely so we get a really good feel for what it is and what they're trying to do, where they are, and so we can adapt and really customize and dovetail the training to what they're trying to do. One of the, re one of the ways we do that is we pick one of their strategic goals, probably one that may, they may be challenged with, and we use that as our practical exercise. And as people come through the different as different modules of the training, we go, okay, how's that going to apply to this goal? And we work directly. That does two things very positively. It makes it very relevant for the participant because it's their organization and they're already aware of the goal and they may already be frustrated by the goal because it's not really getting attained as quickly as it, as, uh, yeah. as it should be. Once you're finished with the training and the program is coming to completion, if you again, if you've done everything properly, you can show an advancement 
in an ideal situation, you've attained the goal. How would it be for an organization to go, okay, we brought in this training organization to develop our people. Along the way, oh yeah, we just knocked off that goal as well. <laughs> we attained that goal because you've concentrated on that as, uh, as mm. your actual practical exercise. How, how do you best learn leadership skills? If you want to learn them to develop them into a skill, there's a number of factors that have to come into play. Some that we provide, some that they provide. First of all, you, you break down leadership into its constituent elements, which we do, and those are our different modules, so you understand. Uh, one of the biggest aspects of leadership uh, versus management in the first little bit, the first module in, in, in our leadership program is, okay, let's make sure that we all understand what the difference is between management and leadership. And that's uh, essentially the difference, it, it's, it's analogous to what's the difference between being a technical person or a salesperson versus being a leader or a manager title, but now you're gonna to have to lead people. I didn't even realize there was differences. There are points of difference between <laughs> being a manager and being a leader. There. There's a huge difference, actually. They're both, uh, they're both, ne both necessary, absolutely necessary, but most people, I would suggest, uh, don't truly know the difference. Um, many think that they do, and they can put a little bit of a definition together, but then they'll intermix them and they'll use them differently. If, but if you can think clearly uh, that they have distinct differences and then thus distinct talents and, and skills that you need to do them, it kind of clear thing, clears things up for you a little bit. The easiest way to describe it is you manage things and you lead people. And so you, you're, all of your systems, your processes, your procedures, uh, all of your uh, equipment and tools, those are managed. And you manage aspects of the people. You manage their schedules. You manage their contracts and things like that. After that, it's leadership to get them motivated and even more so pro preferably inspired and then uh, understanding and appreciating and working towards a particular direction, that's leadership. The difference between doing a technical versus doing a, a management position, which is actually leadership, is 180 degrees different with regard to the skill set. So are those. Now, you can do both. You can be a leading manager, because obviously your title is be managers, but you manage things as well. You manage reports and you manage uh, systems and you manage procedures and processes, but you have to also lead people. Now, it's kind of like the old adage, every cognac's a brandy, but not every brandy's a cognac. Every leader can be a manager, but not every manager can be a leader. And having said that, there's another uh, aspect of that, is you don't have to be a manager to be a leader. You can have leaders within your organization that don't hold uh, levels or titles of management. Mm. As a matter of fact, that's exceptional. So they can be the, the in, internal guru in that particular area and lead the rest of the group. I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. They can probably think in the company they work for and thinking, actually, yeah, that person might be the manager, but that person's the leader. Yeah. And, they're, and yeah, they're not always synonymous, yeah. Yeah, or husband and wife team, really, anyway. Um. <laughs> cool. yeah. Hopefully bring things and compliment. As long as it compliments, at the end of the day, they, uh, each, all, everybody brings something to the party. Michael, can you tell me about emotional intelligence? What is it, and how do you unlock the secrets of emotional intelligence? Uh, emotional intelligence is, we've said a number of times uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the interview that there's differences between one aspect and another. If you're going to say what is that difference, what makes leadership different than management, I would have to hang my hat on emotional intelligence. That is the key. It probably makes up 75 or more percent of what's going to make you a good leader or not, or a leader or not a leader. What, emotional intelligence is just emotions. We are human beings. We are just a one big bound up pile of emotions. That's what we are. What we do with those emotions and how we manage those emotions is the key to how we perform ourselves individually and how we perform and get other people inspired or to work with us. And amongst themselves. So emotional intelligence is really just being aware and understanding and appreciation for, yes, that we're just a bundle of emotions and the fact that so is everyone else. Once you're aware of these things and you can practice them, you get better at it and you can develop a skill in being, and that's the key to leadership because then you can have a, a really good understanding control of yourself as well as understanding and uh, relationship 
with everyone else. So give us one thing or one part I can work on at the moment to help my emotional intelligence. The starting point is always with yourself. So the first and foremost thing is, is self-awareness. If I was going to sit, tell anybody and say, okay, you know what? I really want to develop. I really want to be better. I want to be a good leader. Where do I start? I would say start with two things. Start with self-awareness and your sense of curiosity. So I'll park the curiosity thing for a moment and we'll talk about self-awareness. So self-awareness is really, it's just what it says. It's being aware of yourself. And not all of us are all the time. So everybody has a definition of themselves. You know, who is Courtney? Courtney is uh, a videographer and, 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 and production, uh, a producer of videos, for example. Courtney's also a father. Courtney's a husband. Courtney's a, a golfer. Uh, Courtney's a lot of things, as we all are. So we all have a hundred different things that we can define ourselves on. So we think that we have a pretty good understanding of who we are, or a self-awareness. But as I mentioned earlier, we're all bundles of emotions. And until we can understand and relate to those emotions, then they're going to run wild. So we are going to control them, or they're going to control us. So you get, so you've seen people in certain situations, and they just lose their cool, or they are lacking self-confidence, or they just don't relate to people, or they, they can't uh, interact or build relationships. That's predominantly because of your, your self-awareness and your, how, how you're relating to your own emotions. Because emotions are what drive action. Everybody thinks that we decide rationally about things. We think about things rationally, but most of the time we don't decide rationally. You always think something comes in and we go, okay, decide on this or that, or I have to deal with this person. Oh, I don't want to have to deal with that person because they're, they're difficult to get along with. And, oh, my God. So you're thinking this through your rational brain, and then you react. That reaction is, I don't want to have to deal with that because uh, they're angry or they're negative or they're this or that or the other. That's emotion. What it's driving you to do now is not act or to not act properly. So you feel, feed that back through your, through your uh, rational brain and it goes, eh, I have to do something, so I just do something, but I'm not sure what to do. Well, that's the external part, but knowing that and having that conversation with yourself, so, oh, hang on, I'm feeling like I don't want to do this because I'm avoiding it for whatever reason. That's an emotion. We filter things through our own value systems as well. So you have a cognitive, ration, cognitive rational brain, then you have, everyone has their own sense of values, uh, but it's the emotion that drives action. All actions are driven by emotion. So you need to corral those emotions and get an understanding, appreciation, and control if you're going to have that action be positive and in the right direction that you want it to be. Otherwise, it's going to spin off in a direction that you probably don't want it to do. And we've all done it, and we do it from time to time, but the objective is to do it, to have as much control and understanding and appreciation of those as you possibly can. That's self-awareness. That's a skill you can learn. You can practice it and get better at it. And you go, oh, that's just the way I am, or they're gonna, you know, I just get pissed off now and again. Well, yeah, that might be make you feel better. How's it gonna make the rest of the people that you're dealing with or the client? Probably be better if you actually learned how to deal with that. Uh, and that's not meaning you go for to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, knowing how to understand and have a chat with yourself and say, okay, ooh, there's an emotion. Stop, think about it. Then you have filtered the emotion through the rational brain. Mm -hmm. Now you start making more rational decisions rather than emotional decisions. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I can relate to it. I was even just relating to it in a, in a husband and wife sense. And when very you, much. When, when you very much. Key things sent you off down a certain path. Mm. You go, hang on. Oh, no, I'm doing that same thing again. Why yeah. do I keep doing that? And, that, well, that? and that's the trick. That's what we, that's what we teach is... You ask yourself, why do I keep doing that? And then you go, well, why do I actually keep doing that? And could I do something else? Well, let's try doing something else. And then you practice it and you practice it and you practice it and that becomes the skill or the habit. And that's the way you act, react in, in the future. And that's, that's the changing of it all. I mean, what we're teaching, and one of the, one of the challenges, as I said earlier, that uh, leadership is coming back into the forefront partially because it's necessary. You know, there's very, very minuscule now areas of how to take advantage of in, in, you know, against your competitors or in the marketplace or whatever, whatever you're trying to, to uh, establish and do. People is the key. You know, it's coming back around to the people again. So what we're teaching are really life skills. But if I went out there and said, hey, I want to teach life skills, 
organizations are going to look at me and go, well, we don't need any life skills. We, we make widgets. You know? <laughs> we don't need any life skills. That's, people can do that in their own time. <laughs> well, no, because you need them for the organization. That's the other. Remember, they're spending more time with that family than they are on their own. So let's work on that family and uh, give them some life skills. That's what leadership is. It's an emotional intelligence. It's going to help all the participants, anybody that takes part in this in this training. It's going to help you in all aspects of your life. Well, that makes complete sense. If I go and learn some safety information, I don't just put that in my work situation. I put it in my home situation yeah. and everything else Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, definitely. I mean, the amount of times now I do th- so things differently <laughs> after going to so many safety briefings from my insight. <laughs> That now back at home, mm. I, I don't operate a lot of the same way. I mm. don't do guarding the same way. I wear my steel caps doing things I'd never thought to wear my steel caps to do or put gloves on and eye protection on. So it makes sense if you're going to learn the emotional skills, you, you're going to put them into practice in your whole life. And what a better thing to put in practice in your whole life than emotional skills. And it comes, that's behavioral psychology. You're, you're, we're developing and uh, adapting and getting more, a change in our habits. And, and that's what a new skill is just a change in your habit or at least or unveiling something that you can make into a habit, a positive habit. Positive, positive, positive is the main thing. You want to have a positive result rather than either continue to do something that's not really uh, working uh, or not knowing what to do. That's not being productive or positive. So th- it's a behavioral change that, uh, that you're developing. I did the same thing. I mean, I didn't spend my whole career in hotels and resorts. I spent uh, the last seven years on, uh, on the Gorgon Project as, uh, as a site managers and doing uh, leading teams and doing uh, things to build the, uh, the LNG plant up on Barrow Island. Now, that's a quite different environment from a five-star ho- hotel. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's less different than you think when you're dealing with people and you're leading teams. And that's the other thing. I used to run into the stigma uh, about, oh yeah, well, yeah, he runs, he ran hotels, but we build widgets. How is he going to be able to come in and help us? <laughs> because what I'm coming in to help you with is synonymous. You got people? We have people? They got people? There's a common denominator. We can help. Michael, tell me about constructive change. Uh, constructive change is another one of our programs. Why do we call it constructive change? Uh, mostly because of the uh, broadly and perhaps not succinctly used term, change management. Everybody has heard about change management. But the way we approach it and what we believe is that uh, change management is only half of the equation. Because, again, uh, like there's management and leadership, in change there's management and leadership. So we have an approach of, here's, there's, in order to have a successful change, whether it's an organizational change, a systemic change, whatever change that you're going to be going through, and they're flying at you fast and furious these days, uh, you have to have a resilient group within your organization to be able to deal with those and know how to deal with them. And there's two elements. You're going to have to manage part of it, and you're going to have to lead part of it. So that's why we call it constructive change, because there's a management aspect, there's a leadership aspect, and there's a skill set and resilience aspect to it as well. And we bring all of those together in a package that we call constructive change. With MSB Max, what is the communication skill development? Uh, communication skill development is another one of our five main programs that we, uh, we offer. Communication is probably a cornerstone of leadership. If you can't communicate properly, uh, then you're going to have a real challenge getting uh, people aligned and uh, cooperative and understanding and uh, to build integrity and trust. You can't do it without communication. Now, the funny thing about communication is we all think we're brilliant at it uh, because we've been doing it since we were two, uh, in, and we have been doing it to an extent, uh, but there's a whole lot more to it if you want to do it properly and to be effective at it. And that, so that takes in a lot of elements from everything from uh, just how you talk and how you represent yourself, as well as it's communication, so it's not just delivering, it's receiving, active listening. How do you, how are you actually, are you actually listening? And to remind people that you're listening to me, but are you now, are you thinking about what your response is? Or are you actually hearing what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Most people would be the latter. And you have to be aware of that. That's part of your self-awareness as well. You're, am I aware? Hang on, stop. Stop, brain. You're starting to formulate the answer. They're not even finished giving you the giving you the communication yet. 
So that's a mistake that we make all the time. I do it, I can't, but, I, but I've taught myself to catch myself doing it. So I'm not trying to formulate the answer or jumping to a conclusion before I hear everything the person's saying. Because they may be a person that likes to talk about flower, you know, here we go and 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 here we go. And here we go. Whew, man, my head is floating. When they, what their whole message is, is over here and they haven't even got there yet. Meanwhile, you're going, oh, I know what you mean, I understand, and, you're, and, you, and they go, oh no, actually this is what I wanted to say over here. <laughs> and some people are like that. There's going to be people on your team and that you work with and that you know that are like that. Unless you develop the skill, you're never really going to communicate well with that person because they've never gotten to where, what they actually want to say. You've formulated something and jumped back in. That's active listening. Be an active listener. That's an element. Another element of, of, is, of it is, uh, is body language and nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication are things like, uh, uh-huh, mm -hmm. right? Would you yeah. know that we're mirroring each other right now, Michael? Yes, that mirroring is another aspect of, not, of, uh, of body language. Uh, and there's some studies that suggest that somewhere 60 to 70% of your communication is your body and not is nonverbal. So between your body language and your uh, enunciations, if you will, or the, the, the grunts and murmurs and things that you make that aren't words, uh, that make up, makes up a great deal. Eye contact, how you're... Uh, how you're dealing, you know, hand, how you're using your hands. All of those factors are more important and playing a larger part in the message that we're sending and the message that's being received than most people give credit to. And so much so that we thought this deserves and needs a, uh, a program on, onto itself because it's exceptionally important if we, because we don't work with a bunch of mind readers. Wonder what Sophie would be saying about our body language right now, especially seeing that like, she'd be really impressed. That I noticed we're mirroring each other. <laughs> were you impressed with that, Sophie? You watching? Uh, Put a like so. somewhere, Thanks, Sophie, Sophie. If you if you liked our mirroring and and, uh, and for those of you that want to learn more about that, uh, please go back to a previous episode uh, of Slice TV with Courtney, who uh, who interviewed uh, who interviewed Sophie, and uh, we want to say as well. Uh, that uh, we're absolutely delighted that Sophie's part of our team. So in, uh, in addition to what she does uh, with her own company, she's been indispensable with assisting us in writing and, and putting our program, our communication program together, uh, particularly the nonverbal and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the body language portion. And she will actually help us deliver it as well. So uh, we have other associates that are specialists within MSB Max that all add and contribute to the whole, uh, which is uh, hopefully the best package that we can put together for for uh, our uh, clients. Over here in the West, where we'd be the predominant part of your business being mm -hmm. based here. We're in a little downturn because we have our two-tiered, two two-speed economy, I should say, <laughs> fast and slow. How does that work with leadership? Is now the time to work on your teams or is now the time to just sit back and relax? Is it more <laughs> crucial now? I'm hoping you're gonna say one more than the other. Uh, it's without a doubt absolutely more crucial. So we're coming off a period where people have really been able to make a lot of hay because the sun's been shining a long time. Uh, in those periods, it's fantastic. You do really, you do well, but you don't have to exert a lot of muscles. And when times get a little bit more lean, then you have to rely on those muscles, if you will, uh, a little more. And uh, that's why you have to have those skills and those, uh, that capability and that capacity within, within your uh, organization. If you don't, then you have to develop it, and you have to develop it quickly. Because as I said, the main competitive advantage you're going to have is you're going to be your people. And that's already here, and it's not going to change for a while. People are the, are, are, are the be-all and end-all. It's just that they're finally being emphasized because they've, uh, everything else has been exhausted. You've closed all the gaps on, on, on all the other points of difference. Uh, it's now going to come down to what can my people do and what, are, what can we do together that really is going to make the difference. And so in a downturn, you need that more than ever. You absolutely need it. It's going to be the best investment you're going to make because if you don't make it, you may not have that decisions to make much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads to a point that I wanted to raise with you, we talked about a while ago, was um, 
Com companies don't think twice about upgrading their systems and processes mm. or their systematic assets, I think is the word you use, but they don't do it for their biggest asset, their people. Yeah, so you're right. happy to go, oh, geez, we should get the X machine and have the sheet machine that goes ding <laughs> to have that bit of point of difference, but they don't look at their people. Is that something that you have noticed? Oh, noticed. It's the reason I'm in this business, really. That's that's the one that's been the biggest frustration over the course of my whole uh, career in life. I've seen it internally with the organizations that I've worked with and tried to uh, influence it, and hopefully I, I have uh, to a, to a good extent. I've certainly seen it externally. Uh, it's been a good portion of the things that I've learned over the, over the course uh, and that we're bringing together for this program. People just don't, yeah, the systemic things, the equipment that they use, the tools. Um, no question. It seems like that's a that's a that's a slam dunk or a, you know a no-brainer for organizations that when they need to make that investment they do. With regard to their people, I think it's a it's a little more complex as to why they don't, and it could vary from situation to situation. But it's going to be a combination of uh, they're not exactly sure how to do that. People are liveware. You know, you got your hardware. No problem. We replace that every five years because that's when the accountants tell us we can, and that's when the uh, upgrades come in. You know, we place our software because that one's not doing what we needed, or there's a better one that's come on the market. No problem. We spend for that. Our liveware, our people. Uh, you can't just throw a, a training program at them and say, "Hey, we think this is going to help," and they go, "Okay, whatever." They got buy-in in it. They, they do they feel like they're really contributing? But if you do it in a, in a way where they feel this is going to help me and it'll help the company, but it'll make it's relevant to what I'm doing. Hell, the exercises we're doing is our, one of our strategic goals. That really has traction and it'll get buy-in because you can be the best trainer in the world, you can have the best programs in the world, just like the best organization, you can have the best systems and equipment in the world. But as a trainer, if you, uh, you can only lead them to the water, if they don't want to drink, then that's their choice what we can do is we can make sure we lead them to the best most sparkling crispy clear the tastiest water going uh that's more that's relevant to them and uh, they're more likely to drink well michael thank you for talking to us about leadership i hope everyone enjoyed our discussion on leadership and msb max is the place to come to by the sounds of it if you're looking to increase the leadership quality skills in your employees or just even yourself um, but we'll have to talk again on more things to do with leadership down the track. Michael, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for joining us. It's been us. my pleasure, and hopefully we didn't bore anybody to tears, uh, but uh, hopefully provided some information and perhaps even some motivation to uh, look into it a little more. Absolutely. Leadership's where it's at. Till next time, speak soon. Bye All for now. Nice. Ciao.